Dear Father, Heavenly Father, what an awesome privilege it is to be here in Michigan before pastors and teachers and Bible workers and uh, conference leaders. And Lord, you know that we are in amazing times. There's a lot happening in the world and there's a lot happening in the church, in your church. And we pray for your Holy Spirit. Please take charge, Lord. You know the difficult travel travel uh, trip that I've just had, and thank you for bringing me here safely, in spite of the weather and the delays and the rerouting of my flights and a flight in the middle of the night. Thank you for bringing me here. Bless us all and speak to us, Lord. We have a lot to learn. Help us to be like little children listening to your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I would like to start with uh, a number of verses in the book of Revelation. I think this will kind of set the, set the stage. Revelation chapter 14, I'm assuming you have your Bibles. It's great to be in the Michigan Conference. I love this conference. Elder Gallimore is uh, on our White Horse Media board now which is a big blessing to us. Revelation 14, we know the three angels' messages. We need to know them better. But at the end of the three angels, this is something I've just recently been really thinking about and impressed with. Revelation 14, verse 14, when the three angels' messages are done, when the work is done, after the loud cry and the close of probation, and the time of trouble, and everything that is ahead of us. Verse 14 says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap. For, and then what does it say? For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. I've recently just been thinking about that one little phrase there, the time has come for you to reap. And uh, recently I've been doing a lot of study concerning Lucifer's rebellion in heaven, Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 1. There's a lot of light in that chapter about what Lucifer went through and his arguments to convince the angels to join his side in his warfare against God. And it's very clear in Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 1 that the reason why God didn't destroy Lucifer right away was because he, he wanted to give him time, time to develop his character, because the angels at that point had never seen rebellion before. They had never seen anything like this before. And if God just eliminated him, there'd be a lot of questions that would still be there in his universe. And God didn't want that. He wanted everything to be out in the open. So everybody, all the angels would know why his way is the right way. But he couldn't do that without allowing Lucifer time to develop his principles. The rebellion had to get ripe, if you know what I mean. And, so that, and that's really the whole reason why God has allowed this whole great controversy to go on in the first place. He's given a, a period of time, 6,000 years approximately, to allow the great controversy to develop so that the whole universe and eventually all humanity that we can all see what is the real fruit of evil and what is the real fruit of righteousness. What does evil really look like and what does righteousness really look like? And, and of course, the, one of the biggest demonstrations was on the cross when uh, the universe saw Satan in his 
in his hideousness, and they saw God and his love in, in the most incredible way that's ever been revealed. Now, as I'm thinking about the last days, God, see, it seems to me that God is following the same principle with what's going on in the world and in the church. He's going to let things develop. And when things develop, we're told that the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest, right? That's what Jesus says. said, uh, God's going to let things develop. And this verse in verse 15 says, the time is come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. That tells me that the Lord is, is, is going to wait until the harvest is fully ripe before he returns and puts in the sickle. So I think we're seeing this uh, in the world, and I, and I you know, hate to say it, but I think we're going to see things in the church as well, that we're going to see evil ripen like, it's, like we've never seen it before. And, now, and by contrast, if evil is going to ripen, then what else is going to ripen? Righteousness. Righteousness is going to ripen. That's right. So we're going to see both. And let's go to Revelation 22. Both sides that are going to ripen are pinpointed in Revelation 22, verse 11. The close of probation. And actually, we can read verse 10. He said to me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. There again, we have timing, you know, just like the, the time has come to reap. The time is at hand. And then verse 11, Jesus says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So we have his coming uh, after both sides are completely crystallized, right? Probation closes. The two groups are fully ripe. And then Jesus returns. And here we have the two groups. On the one side, we have uh, those who are unjust and those who are filthy. So if we want to, you know, kind of put some words to what it's like to be on the wrong side, those are the two words that the Lord uses for the close of, at the close of probation. It's the unjust and filthiness. So we can expect to see uh, a lack of justice and injustice growing and getting ripe, and we can expect to see filthiness getting ripe in this world. And on the other side we can expect to see, Jesus says, he that is what? Righteous. Right, he that is righteous. Hey, Philip, that you, right? Good to see you. Uh, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. So there's the two sides. There's the two sides. And as I was just thinking about these verses, it just impressed me that uh, the harvest is ripening and God wants to ripen us on the right side. Amen. He wants us to be getting, he, he wants righteousness to be growing among his people. And he wants holiness to be growing among his people at the same time that uh, injustice or the unjust and filthiness is growing at the same time. So that's quite a contrast, isn't it? I mean, the Lord just draws the line, it's puts both sides right there. So tying this in with righteousness by faith, the only way that we can be, as Jesus says here, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. That's where righteousness by faith comes in. The, the message of the righteousness of Christ is a message that is going to develop God's people so that they are righteous. 
And that's what I hope to sort of unpack this, uh, this workers' meeting. You know, what does that mean? What does that look like? How does that become practical so that we can be in this, in this group? That's where righteousness by faith comes in. Does that make sense? We want to be among the righteous. And the only way we're going to get righteous is by faith. The only way we're going to get righteous is through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. We need the Lord. I need the Lord. You need the Lord. We all need the Lord. And we're in the ripening time. Um, let me talk a little bit about the book that you have. I'm curious, how many of you have read this book? Okay, one, two. Okay, I, I guess I'll say great, because that gives you a whole lot, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people that have never read this before that will be reading this. This is my book, published by Pacific Press. I wrote it a number of years ago. God's last message, Christ our righteousness. And I, and I want to share with you some of the background of how I discovered this message. Because I know that within the church, there's a lot of different views on righteousness by faith. I'm sure you're aware of that. There's many different uh, opinions, interpretations, views, etc. that are out there. And I don't want uh, just to be another view. <laughs> and, and, and I don't want to just learn another view. I want to learn the truth. Amen. I want the real message of the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Now, I'll just share with you some personal, personal facts that hopefully will be helpful to you. I've learned in my ministry that when I go through trials and then I... The Lord brings me through them, and I share with others some of the details of what has happened, kind of like a testimony. I've learned that people many times really appreciate that because they can relate to struggles. Um, I am almost 60 years old. I became a Christian when I was 20. I grew up in... Studio City, North Hollywood in Southern California. Grew up in a Jewish home, very secular Jewish home. We were not Christians. My, my father and my mother and my brother and my sister, uh, none of us went to church. We didn't regularly go to the synagogue. We didn't read the Bible. We didn't pray. I never learned the story of Noah and the Ten Commandments. Didn't know anything about this. I was surrounded by the Hollywood life and the temptations of the Hollywood life. When I was 14 years old, I went to public schools for the first 20 years. When I was 14, uh, one of my classmates offered me a, a smoke at the back of a school bus on the way to school, and I took it, and it was a marijuana, they called it, we called it a joint and I began smoking pot at the age of 14. And I did that for six years, just about every day. Got into harder drugs, got into uh, things like quaaludes and <clears throat> LSD <clears throat> and uh, angel dust. <clears throat> and I lived a really bad life. And it's amazing that I'm alive, that I'm even here at all. God has been very, very good to me. I'm a brand plucked out of the fire. <laughs> And when I was 20 years old, a lot happened. Uh, when I was 20 years old, to make a long story short, um, I turned on the television set and saw George Vandeman, out of the blue, talking about the Bible Sabbath. Saw him one time. The, uh, he, he, offered me a, he offered a free book right on TV, looked at me, and he said, friend, call me up and I'll send you this book called The Day to Remember. An 800 number came on the screen. I called, I felt compelled, call that man who's holding up that book on the phone. So I did, and, I, and the book came in the mail a few days ago, or a few, I mean a few days later. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> a 
book came in the mail a few days later. I read it, and then it suggested at the end of the book that I find a Seventh-day Adventist church. The book was about the Sabbath. And uh, so I found an Adventist that I knew worked at a health food store. He brought me to church. I met the pastor. The pastor gave me a copy of the book Desire of Ages. I read Desire of Ages cover to cover in a dormitory room at Cal State Northridge, my third year of college, while I was still smoking pot. I read Desire of Ages, and by the time I was done with Desire of Ages, that was it. My whole life was changed. And it was really the Garden of Gethsemane that really reached me. It was Jesus' struggle in the Garden of of Gethsemane. And uh, within a very short time, I landed at La Sierra College and began studying for the ministry. God just went boom, 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 boom. Just like on that plane, he opened the the Red Sea and said, there's your bed. (laughs) He did the same thing for me in 1979, and he brought me into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I landed at La Sierra, and one of my first classes, uh, my textbook was Desire of Ages. And I thought, wow, this is amazing, Lord, thank you. (laughs) Instead of being at Cal State Northridge in a co-ed dorm with the marijuana smoke and and the cafeteria becoming a disco on Saturday nights, and guys and girls in my room, because my roommate decided to host a party in my, in our dorm room. Now, I was at La Sierra studying for the ministry. I was a Seventh-day Adventist, and Desire of Ages was my textbook. It was pretty amazing. Well, anyway, for the first six years, first six years of being an Adventist, maybe the first three years, things went really well. I was very happy. I was uh, at peace. I had a lot of joy, I I loved the Lord, I loved the Bible, I loved going to school and going down on the Hollywood Boulevard on Friday and Saturday nights and giving out Desire of Ages and Steps to Christ and had a whole group of us that went down there and did missionary work. And uh, the Lord really, really blessed. But I was very, I was inexperienced, I was not, you know, seasoned at all when it comes to the Christian life. And because I, I was from Hollywood, North Hollywood, and I actually worked in, in the movies for a while as an extra, uh, for one summer I was uh, an extra working on different shows, and that's when I first began to read the Bible. And then that's when I saw George Vanham, and after that, uh, when I became an Adventist, and I'm just going to be you know, brutally honest with you, I, sh- I shared my testimony quite a bit with other people, and I didn't realize at the time that it, it can be dangerous to your spiritual life to uh, talk about things that you used to do, you know, Hollywood and the movies and these kind of things. And... After about four years of being an Adventist, five years, when I got, first I went, I went through La Sierra, was hired by the Central California Conference. I was a young pastor in Bakersfield, and after a year, the conference sent me to the seminary. I went to Andrews for two years, and during my time at Andrews, now I was about four or five years into being a Christian, things, I started having some, uh, some problems, some struggles. And what happened was... Uh, my, the peace that I had in, in the Lord began to go away. And I began to, you know, not sense the presence of God as much as I did when I first became a Christian. And um, I struggled with that. And I had a roommate in college at, at uh, the seminary, and he was searching like I was. And he, we, we lived in Berman Hall. Is that, does anybody live in Berman Hall? <laughs> we lived in Berman Hall, and I was there for a couple of years. And uh, things just weren't going that well. I was struggling. I, I was praying, Lord, where are you? I, I, was, I would read the Bible, and the Word was not alive to me like it was when I first became a Christian. It seemed kind of far away. 
And I, I didn't know what was going on. And so my roommate uh, and I, you know, he started suggesting, he started kind of searching into uh, Christian psychology and then secular psychology. And he started reading quite a few books of different books that he recommended to me. And he was on a journey as I was, you know, we were both struggling. We were trying to figure things out and make a long story short, uh, I got very confused. But I was exposed to a lot of ideas and I don't blame the seminary at all. Really, I don't. I had good teachers. But by the time I was nearing the end of my two years at the seminary, I was struggling with, um, with different ideas. I was confused. And so, have any of you heard my talk on audio verse called uh, I Burn My Ellen White Books? <laughs> Some of you have. My roommate suggested, because Ellen White wasn't connecting to me either, or I wasn't connecting with her and her writings. I was struggling with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And so he suggested that because this was creating a lot of tension inside me, that he, he's, my roommate suggested that we have a bonfire at the back of Berman Hall in the, in the woods. So believe it or not, we took all my spirit of prophecy books, went into a, a place in the back of the dorm, or behind the dorm in the, in the forest, and we had a big bonfire, and I burned all my Ellen White books. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And, I, and I, didn't, I didn't do it to be rebellious. I did it because I thought maybe I need a break and a fresh start. I was looking for healing, emotional healing. And, uh, but as you can imagine, you know, that was not a wise decision on my part. <laughs> And I left uh, the seminary, and I went back to the Central California Conference when my time was done, and I pastored two churches in San Francisco in, the, in that area, a Russian church and an English church in the Pacifica area. I was still single. I lived in an apartment by myself. And now it's about six years since I've been a, an Adventist, and I was really struggling at this point. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I can continue to be a minister because how can I you know, stand up in front of my church on Sabbath and, and lead this church and be a pastor when I don't feel connected? I don't feel like I've really got the Lord with me. And I know we have to live by faith, but you still need to have some sense that God is leading your life. And I was very confused and I thought, Lord, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And again, I'm going to make a long story short. Uh, I got on my knees one night in, San Fr in uh, Pacifica in my little apartment, turned off the lights, and I prayed, and I said something like, Jesus, if you don't do something, I I'm going to go back to my old life. I'm just going to leave the ministry and go back to doing something because I cannot continue to be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor when my life is falling apart and I don't have peace and I'm struggling with my relationship with you, and I can't really understand the Bible anymore, and I'm not reading the spirit of prophecy either. So there was a crisis, and during this crisis, as I was praying, and I don't hear voices in my head, but there was a deep conviction. It was like a thought. It was a conviction that came to me, and the conviction said, pray for the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth. John 16, 13, Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And so I had this, this conviction, Steve, what I want you to do is pray for the spirit of truth to guide you into all truth. That's not my phone. I turned mine off. It's got my same ringer though. So as I began to do this, I began to, uh, so, uh, so anyway, I began to do this. I thought, all right, Lord, I'll do it. I'll pray for the, whole, for the spirit of truth. So I began to pray like I'd never prayed for this before. I said, Jesus, give me the spirit of truth and help me to understand the truth. And, and somewhere during that time, I opened up, I turned on the light and I opened up the Bible. And Psalm 119, verse 67 Psalm 119, verse 67. This verse saved my life. This one verse saved me. God used this verse to save my soul. I wouldn't be here right now probably if it wasn't for this verse. 
Verse 67, Psalm 119. I, I read this verse where David said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. And, I, I, and because I was now praying for the Holy Spirit, I looked at this verse, I saw this verse. Somehow I just found this verse. And I looked at this verse, and I, and I remember thinking about this verse. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. And I thought, I am certainly afflicted right now. My, my life is afflicted, my mind is afflicted, my emotions are afflicted, I'm struggling. And then I thought, is it possible that before I was afflicted, I went astray? Maybe in the last five or six years, being a Christian, somehow I strayed away. And then it says, but now I have kept your word. Your word. So I thought, Lord, have I strayed away from your word? Is that why I'm afflicted? Have I somehow strayed away from the word of God? And then I began to do a Bible study on, somehow the Lord directed me to do a Bible study on pride. And I began to understand. I studied Lucifer's pride. I studied the pride of, uh, of Israel, of Assyria, of the Pharisees, of the Laodiceans, of Babylon who sits and says, I'm a queen and I'm, I'm no widow and I will see no sorrow. And I started seeing this theme of pride run all throughout the Bible. And then I began to look at myself in the mirror and the Holy Spirit began to convict me that the reason why I had slowly, step by step, separated myself from Jesus and the reason why I couldn't understand the Bible anymore and the reason why Ellen White's writings were not connecting with me was because little by little by little, there was a lot of Steve Wahlberg in my Christian life. Too much. Too much of me, not enough of him. And even my testimony where I would share, you know, I came out of Hollywood and I did this and that and I became a Christian now. That even my testimony, there was self woven in and I was little by little exalting myself. And, you know, where John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. That's the goal of the Christian life, is that we're supposed to get smaller and he's supposed to get bigger. And I didn't really understand that. And I didn't understand my own self, my own nature, the own the subtlety of my own uh, bent towards self-righteousness. And in San Francisco, through praying for the Holy Spirit, I began to discover that the problem was not the Lord. The problem was not Ellen White. The problem was not the Bible. The problem was, guess who? It was me, Steve Wahlberg. And that's why I lost my peace. And I had strayed from the word. So I began a journey to come back to the word of God. And eventually I decided I'm going to pick up the spirit of prophecy again. I'm going to read the testimonies. So I started rereading the testimonies. And I started rereading the conflict series and rereading the Bible. And to make a long story short, little by little by little, the peace of God came back to me. And, and, the, and I began to see where I had strayed step by step. And of course, that bonfire was a big one, <laughs> that bonfire. And I had to confess, and I confessed that, Lord, I'm sorry for burning the books of your prophet. Please forgive me. Will you still have mercy on me? And he said, oh, yes, I've got lots of mercy. <laughs> the Lord has lots of mercy. Can you imagine? I mean, I burned a whole pile of her books, but the Lord still left me. He understood. And so within a short time after my life began to come back together, I was offered a job to teach at Weimar. And I went, I went from San Francisco to Weimar, and I became a Bible Academy Bible teacher for three years at Weimar Academy, teaching freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. And guess what my textbooks were? Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages, and the book Education. And, all, and when I was at Weimar, 
the, the healing process, the journey continued. And I remember now, back to the righteousness by faith message. When I got to Weimar, I began, uh, I read this, I read a quote. If you, if you have this book, if you want to open up to page 12, if you've got a copy of my book there, on page 12, there is a quote from the book Testimonies to Ministers. Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 and 92. And when I was at Weimar, and I'm only scratching the surface, there's so many things that happened to me. There were times when I was praying for the Holy Spirit, praying for the Spirit of Truth, where I would feel the devil fighting me, fighting me, fighting me, fighting me. There were times when I could feel evil spirits leave my body. I could feel them coming up and going out. This may sound strange to you, but, but uh, I felt that many, many, many times. My body was a battlefield. The war was intense. But God had pointed me in the right direction through impressing me to pray for the spirit of truth. And I began to get back to the Bible. And then I began to study pride. And then I began to see my own, my own defects and where I had strayed, and how I needed to get back. And it was like the path, you know, just like, the, just like on the plane. The path opened up and said, there's your bed. You can go to sleep on a red-eye flight. It was like the Lord opened up a path for me, and he said, this is where I want you to go. I want you to come back to the Bible, back to the spirit of prophecy, back to the truth, pray for the Holy Spirit, do this day after day after day, and I will put your life back together. And little by little, all that confusion from different psychological concepts of books that I had read, little by little, the confusion went away as I got back to the Word of God. And then when I was at Weimar, I was reading and teaching my students, and one day I picked up testimonies to ministers, and I read this quote. It's right there in the middle there. Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 and 92. Where, and I read this at Weimar, where Ellen White wrote that the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to lift more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. Isn't that wonderful? All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Now that is a powerful quote. And basically what this book is, is it's a study of that paragraph, looking at all those different elements point by point. And, and I remember when I was at Weimar and I read this, I remember thinking to myself, hmm, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. And I remember thinking to myself, all right, Steve, you, you, you now once again believe in the spirit of prophecy. You believe in Ellen White's writings. You're, you're reading those writings again. The, the bonfire is behind you. Now you're reading these books. You're teaching. You're uh, using Steps to Christ and the book Education as your textbooks in teaching high school kids. And, uh, and I thought, all right, I believe in Ellen White. And Ellen White said that God sent a most precious message through Wagner and Jones. So I thought, all right, if uh, Ellen White is God's messenger, and if she said that God sent a message to Wagner and Jones, then I want to, I'm going to go to the source, and I'm going to read what Wagner and Jones had to say. 
And, and I also realized that, you know, and I knew that there was a lot of different views on what Wagner and Jones said. And there's different views on righteousness by faith. So I decided I'm going to go to the source. And, and so at Weimar, I started uh, doing some homework and I began to read some books. Somebody, and I don't have it anymore, I kick myself, but somebody gave me a copy. It was a thick book from microfilm. Uh, Xerox copies of articles that E.J. Wagner wrote in the Signs of the Times in, 19, in 1886, 87, and 88, and 89. Right through the 1888 General Conference period, through the Minneapolis period, this was Wagner at his best. And, the, and he said this is not in print, but somebody got this from uh, microfilm, and I'm going to give you a copy. And I, I lent it to somebody, and I don't remember who it was, and so I, it's gone. Somewhere around 10 years ago, I haven't seen that, that book. But uh, when I was at Weimar, I was reading, so I started reading this, started reading the writings of, of Wagner right through the Minneapolis period. Here's another good book that Wagner wrote, Christ and His Righteousness by E.J. Wagner. And the, and the date on this is 1890. Uh, Bible Studies on the Book of Romans. This was a very powerful book, and I believe this was written right around 1891. Now, I've learned that the writings of Wagner and Jones that there was a period where they were on track. But then if you continue on with their later writings, they developed some problems, and both of them left the church. So I started especially zeroing in on their earlier writings during the time when Ellen White said, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to elders Wagner and Jones. And I began to read their writings, and I began to read the Bible. So I read Romans, I read Galatians. And the amazing thing is, was uh, little by little, the more I read Ellen White's writings pointing me to Wagner and Jones, and then I began to read Wagner and Jones' early writings during the time of the Minneapolis conference, little by little by little, the light began to just, all these little lights went off, boom, 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 boom. And I began to really understand, I, I believe, I began to understand the message of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I began to see it right in the Bible, right in the Word of God. And it became so clear to me. And that's what I want to share with you during this week. So I felt like this introduction would kind of give you a little bit of background of, of uh, how this happened and why I began to study Jones and Wagner's writings. And I'm convinced that when we really, that there was a message. And Ron Duffield has given you the background of the message. But there was a very, very powerful message that these two men shared at the Minneapolis General Conference and beyond this. Jones was the main speaker at the 1893 General Conference session, 1895. Those bulletins are available. You can read the bulletins and go through those studies. Uh, Wagner gave at least nine talks at the Minneapolis conference itself, point by point by point on the righteousness of Christ. And all of these studies were all based on the Bible. So in the little bit of time that we have left, let me just share a couple things from the book of Romans. And this is what we're going to be studying during this week. Romans chapter 3. I'll just, I'll just uh, show you a couple verses in Romans 3. And we're going to unpack this. We're going to talk about righteousness. What is righteousness? We're going to talk about how Jesus Christ is our righteousness. We're going to talk about how that righteousness can cover us as a pure white robe of righteousness. And then we're going to talk about how that righteousness can actually become a part of us and can fill us, where Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. We're going to talk about how this, how this can develop in our experience, and the ultimate goal is so that as the world is ripening in, in evil, and God is ripening his people. He's ripening his people so that we can be in that group where Jesus says, he that is righteous 
let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. We want to be in that group. We want to be among that people. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 says, but now, and then what does he say? The righteousness of God without the law is manifested. God wants to manifest his own righteousness. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, to all and upon all them that believe. So here's the the message of God's righteousness that is to be revealed. Verse 25 talks about Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare, and what does he declare? His righteousness. Right, not our righteousness, but his righteousness. Verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time. And what does God want to declare at this time? Before the time, remember, the time is almost here for the harvest of the earth to be ripe. Timing. And what does God want to give at this time to get us ready for that time? That's right. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. So there are four times in Romans chapter 3, in verse 21, the righteousness of God. Verse 22, the righteousness of God. Verse 25, his righteousness. Verse 26, His righteousness. So the message of the righteousness of Jesus Christ is a message that is in the Bible. God impressed Ellen White to write that God gave a message to Jones and Wagner. And when Jones and Wagner stood up to preach at Minneapolis and at all these different camp meetings and at the general conference sessions from 1887, 88 through 1895, they were teaching this from the Word of God. They were teaching this from the Bible. And through my struggles, you know, God can use struggles for good. (laughs) He uses us. Who was it? Frizee, Elder Frizee said, God's not going to take us out of the oven half-baked. He's going to bake us thoroughly. And God has used my struggles and my battles and my drama with uh, struggling with self and with with the devil, he has taught me the power of his word. David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. That verse saved my life because it showed me the path, that my path back to God was his word. And the more I studied his word and then the spirit of prophecy, leading me to Jones and Wagner, leading me back to the word, leading me to understand the message of the righteousness of Christ. Little by little, it has, it has changed my life. And uh, I'm thankful to say that I'm no longer in that state of utter confusion that I was in when I had the big bonfire. Those days are gone. Uh, and I never want to go back to those days. And I'm glad to be here in Michigan for your workers meeting. I'm glad to have a chance to share with you my journey and the information that's in this book, which ultimately is in this book, which ultimately points to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ our Savior, Jesus Christ our righteousness, Jesus Christ, uh, he has a special name, it says in Jeremiah, this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. And I'm going to explain that to you Uh, during these times that we have together, what does it mean that Jesus is our righteousness? How does that apply practically? How is that good news? How is that powerful news? How can that become the channel for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and for the latter rain in the last days to get us ready for the second coming? And how does that apply to the message, to the third angel's message that we're going to give with a loud voice, with a loud cry during the final crisis 
that's about to hit this world. That's what this is all about. Sound good? Okay, well, I think my time's up. Uh, why don't we kneel together and let's pray. Let's pray that God will, will speak to us and teach us and that he'll teach me, that he'll teach you, that he'll teach us all, that he will be the teacher of righteousness, helping us to understand the message of Jesus. Dear Father in heaven, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, thank you so much for all that you've done for all of us. Lord, thank you that you brought me here. I don't think the devil wants me to be here. But you brought me here in the midst of all these weather-related travel difficulties. Thank you for bringing me here. And I just pray for, for, for all of us for this, uh, this week as we're here at the Michigan camp meeting or Michigan workers meeting. May your, may your Holy Spirit help, help me. Lord, you know I need your help. Use me to teach your word. And Jesus, you are the word of God. Use me to lift you up in a way that will be a tremendous blessing to this conference. And who knows how many other people, you know, that with technology these days, these meetings are going to be recorded and they can ripple out to places all over the world. Bless this, Lord, and prepare your people for the latter rain, for the loud cry, for the final harvest, so we can go home and be with you forever and ever and ever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.